The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And off of that verse, there's a lot of misunderstanding. A sacrifice is something that somebody does for somebody else. In particular, you give up something. And the sacrifice wasn't unknown to Christians or Jewish people back then. Paul's writing, of course, to Romans, Christian believers in Rome. But all religious systems back then had sacrifices. You, you gave sacrifices to the gods and the Roman pantheon. And the reason you gave sacrifices was to manipulate the gods. You wanted them to do something for you on your behalf. And so you offered and they gave. It was basically you paid them for them to do something for you. And many people still approach this verse in the same way. Oh, I got to be a living sacrifice. I got to go out and do, 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 do. And that way, God will think that I'm holy and acceptable. That's a works righteousness way of faith. A works righteousness way of believing. It's not that Jesus died for me because I was a poor, miserable sinner, but Jesus died for me because of all the work he knew that I was going to do on his behalf. I'm such a great guy. Or a great girl, person. And you just wind up doing more and more and more and more because you'll always have the question on the back of your head, is it ever enough? Is it ever enough? Did I have prophecy in proportion to my faith? Did I contribute out of my generosity? Did I lead with zeal? Did I do acts of mercy with cheerfulness? Or was it obligation? And what you're going to find out is when you have that sort of mindset, everything you do is an obligation. I have to do this. I have to come to church. I have to volunteer. I have an obligation to do those things. I have to be merciful. Instead of, we get to come to church. We get to be merciful because God was merciful to us. We get to be a part of the kingdom of God, part of the body with our various offices, our various vocations, whatever they are. Some are the body, the feet, and some are the hands, and some are the hearts, and some are the eyes, and some are the ears. Christ is the head. That means that somebody out there is the elbow. And somebody's the knee. Doing the various things, whether glorious or not. There's not a lot of glory in cleaning the church, but for the people, if we didn't have people cleaning the church, well, what would that say about us? What would it say that how we cared about where we gathered? Or if a visitor came in and they saw that there was filth everywhere and the bathrooms were disgusting. Of course, we're in a pandemic right now, so we don't have to worry about anybody coming into the building. In the Bible, there is actually two living sacrifices. The obvious one is Christ, and we cannot be Christ, but Christ is the sacrifice who rose from the dead. 
the victorious lamb. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As John the Baptist called him. But if you go all the way farther back, all the way back to the book of Genesis, there's a man named Abraham, and he's promised to have a son. And the son comes along, his name is Isaac. Now Abraham was had this son when he was a hundred, and his wife Sarah was ninety-nine. And a little bit after that, somewhere around when Isaac was teenager age-ish, God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice your son. The one who I promised you, the one who I promised that I would bless all the nations through because he's going, he's your descendant and through him will be all your descendants. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And so Abraham takes Isaac out to the place that God directed. It's three-day travel. Isaac's carrying the wood. And he says, hey, Dad, um, where's the sacrifice? You know, we're going out to sacrifice. I'm carrying the wood. Where, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham simply says, you know, the Lord will provide. And they get up there on the mountain. And they build the wood to make the burnt offering sacrifice. And Abraham binds Isaac and he draws the knife back. And all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears and says, Stop. This was a test. And in the same way, God sent his son Jesus to die for us, he actually went through with the sacrifice. But when the angel said, stop, he said, there is the ram. And, and Abraham looks, and there's a ram with his horns caught in a thicket. And the Lord provided the sacrifice. But Isaac was a living sacrifice from that point on. And what did that mean? Isaac was a part of the promise the promise of what? The promise that the Lord would bless all the nations. That the Lord would bring back a right relationship with his creation and himself. And so when Paul says, present yourself, your bodies as a living sacrifice, what does that mean? It means remember that you are a part of of the promise. You are one who, were, who was far off that God draw, drew near. You were the lamb who went astray, the coin who was lost, the prodigal son who was dead and yet now is alive. You are the one that Jesus came and died for. life is not one of obligation but it is one of promise and forgiveness and grace and mercy it is one where the Lord draws near to comfort you in the midst of sadness to rejoice with you in the midst of happiness the one where he promises never to abandon you the one where he says that his name that he is the Christ the Messiah that the gates of hell will not overcome that confession. That you are placed in the hand of God and nothing can take you, can snatch you out of that hand. Not even death itself has a claim on you. So we are holy and acceptable to God because of the sacrifice of Christ. And our spiritual worship is simply living out that mercy every day, not as an obligation, but as a response to the love of God. Martin Luther famously quipped that God does not mean my good works, but my neighbor does. 
God has poured out his love on me. And now I have the ability to love my neighbor. Whether that's my spouse, my children, my actual neighbors, my co-workers, anybody that I come in contact with, as, as the rich man said, and who is my neighbor? And it was the Samaritan, the enemy of the Jewish people. Everybody we come in contact with is our neighbor. So we can't repay God for his mercy. It's simply a gift. It's simply a mercy. But that mercy comes to us and we extend it so that all might know the graciousness of Christ. And for some people, that might mean prophesying in proportion to their faith. And others, acts of mercy with cheerfulness and leading with zeal. For some, it might be the ones in the background that help get things done. And for others, it might be knocking on the neighbor's door and inviting them to church are saying, can I pray with you because I just heard your wife is in the hospital. How can I help in your time of need? For our greatest need has been fulfilled with Christ dying for our sin. So do not have a faith of works but be a living sacrifice relying on the promise of God. In Christ's name, amen.